is 7.05 and we're going to get started. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on our inaugural virtual opening reception for two amazing exhibitions featuring two incredibly talented regional artists. My name is Nanette Girodi and I'm OMA's executive director and I've had the pleasure of getting to know Will and Jill uh, for the past uh, few years in various capacities. It has been fun for me to watch from the sidelines and, uh, and how the exhibitions have evolved and come to life. And I promise you, you are in for a treat when you can visit these exhibitions in person this summer. They are a feast for the eyes and for the mind. I would like to respectfully acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi tribes, or Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. In acknowledging that we occupy colonized Indigenous territories, and out of respect for the rights of Indigenous people, we accept our collective responsibility to recognize our colonial histories, as well as their present day manifestations in order to honor, protect, and sustain this land. Thank you to Monica Segvari, OMA's administrative assistant, the linchpin and the nucleus and the nerve center of our museum. She will be stick handling this presentation with ease and managing the chat space for your questions and your comments. And now I introduce OMA's arts programming coordinator, Tanya Cunnington, the curator of both of these exhibitions. T, over to you. Thank you, Nanette. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be able to celebrate the opening receptions of two new exhibitions at the Real Museum of Art and History. Uh, Jill Price Unfurled, Unsettling the Archive from a More Than Human Perspective, and Will McGarvey Sticks and Stones. Um, thank you for the introduction to Nanette and to Monica and to Jill Price and Will McGarvey for joining us tonight. Uh, so again, yes, we are here to celebrate the installate the exhibitions are on the walls. They are are installed. Uh, they are ready to be seen and we promise that you will get a chance to see them before before long. <laughs> we'll do our best. Um, how is the format going to work for tonight? So each artist, uh, Jill and Will, have given us three images from their exhibition and we will have about 10 minutes for Jill and Will to discuss these images with us. Jill's going to start and Will McGarvey is going to finish. So you will notice though that that's only about half of the planned evening. So we do encourage you to ask as many questions as you would like to tonight. Just like if we are at a real opening reception and celebrating together, please ask as many questions as you would like to. So how do you do that? Two ways. Um, we have the chat option, which we have open and you are welcome to write in a question there and I will gladly ask that on your behalf or if you do want to interact with the artists and you are welcome to do that there is the raise hand option both of these are at the bottom of your screen and so you can click raise hand and I can see that come up and then Monica will do her best to unmute you and you are welcome to interact with the artists that way as well. Uh, I do want to give a quick viewer advisory. Um, Will McGarvey is not afraid to tackle some tough issues. And one of his um, images that he would like to share with and talk about tonight uh, may be offensive to some viewers, but it's important to him that he's able to do that. So viewer advisory out there, please be warned. I will also like to talk to you afterwards about some of the programs that Will and Jill have to offer tonight. Um, we'll definitely touch on those after their after their talks before we end out for the night. And I think I think that is everything I had to say. Um, once again, I'm so excited to be here. This is so much fun. I would love to be doing this in person, but because we can't, this is the next best thing. And so let's all make this a really exciting and fun um, fun evening. How does that sound? All right. So, oh, hold on a second. Somebody can't hear me. Is everything okay? Can everybody hear me? I'm just checking the chat here. I just want to make sure everybody can hear before we move on, before we move forward. We're good? Yes? Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> if you can't hear me, let me know and we'll do our best to make sure that we figure that all out. All right, guys? I want you to enjoy your evening. Perfect. 
All right, so does everybody have their favorite beverage, adult or otherwise? Everybody's kicked back, feet up, ready to have some fun. I think then we will turn it over to uh, Jill Price and let her show some images from Unfurled, Unsettling the Archive from a more than human perspective. Take it away, Jill. Uh, am I to share my slides or is Monica able to do that? I believe that Monica is about to do that. Yeah. Okay. okay awesome. Great. Go ahead, Jill. All right. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Nanette. Um, it's been uh, a real pleasure to be able to, uh, well, a pleasure as well as haunting to work with the archive from a, a more than human perspective um, uh, and a lot of humor as well. Uh, my dark humor came out for this exhibit for sure, but on a more serious note, this journey sort of began with me investigating the origins and shadows of the global textile industry through Eastern Europe, which eventually required me to travel back across the Atlantic Ocean to North America and take a close look at the forms of economic imperialism that led to the exploration, settlement, colonization, and ecological ecocide of many human and more than human cultures across Canada investigations into the Hudson Bay Company and their royal support to expand their extractive and exploitive operations across Canada, as well as HBC's wool goods unknowingly and then strategically used to deliver disease into Indigenous communities, led me to relinquish the wearing of a vintage HBC coat gifted to me just months before. Unable to speak to the complexity of good and bad impacts this had on Canada's First Peoples or the context or living conditions of early settlers and traders, I began to think about what other stories go untold when we are trying to arrive at a bigger picture of truth and begin to make reparations for the ecological and cultural misconduct of our past and present. This first piece in the show, Fur Lined, was a simple way to point to how it was the lives of animals that led to the lining of pockets for those at the forefront of early globe, global trade. Um, and there is also a subtle wordplay reference to trap lines, covering the jacket over with different colors of animal fur retrieved from thrift stores. I have replaced the signature green, yellow, red, and blue stripes of HBC with a color scheme um, indigenous uh, uh, to North America and to disrupt the Eurocentric aesthetics, human-centric values, and capitalist greed that was imported as part of British and French industries. An extension of land back movement, if you will. Um, so I like to think of this piece of forecasting the return of wildlife and them reclaiming their territories in, the, in, this, in this piece. So where this work becomes problematic is that the fur is still used in as, a, as an adornment on the outer side of a human coat. Even in just using the word fur within the title points to the lives of animals as resources or materials for human consumption first. Dawn's having sound issues. And Carol was wondering if you wouldn't mind slowing down just a little bit, Jill? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so in the background uh, on the right hand side of the picture, you can also see a video entitled Unleashed. Uh, in this performance video, I unleash the skin and fur of a rabbit from the construction of a human hat. And in doing so, come to realize the number of rabbits needed in the construction of such a garment, as well as the knowledge and skill that would be required to arrive at this material object. In doing some research on the hunting of rabbit um, from a British colonial perspective, I discovered that these little creatures were only hunted by the upper echelon of society for sport, as the upper class did not deem the meat edible. Often hunted on horseback with pack, a pack of dogs, I began to think of the trauma that a chase of this nature might cause if humans and if humans create trauma, fear, stress in that which we eat or wear, do we unknowingly absorb that hurt or trauma into our own bodies? Um, farmers and hunters who treat animals ethically uh, often um, speak about how big food grocers 
Um, ultimately, when they taste the, the meat that comes out of these centers, they, stay, they feel it, they already taste rotten and sour to their palate. And um, so that I found very interesting. It's really made me sort of have a new respect um, for, for hunters and ethical uh, agricultural workers. Uh, the next slide. Thanks, Monica. So this is a glimpse into a corner in the salon set in the back of the gallery. Um, here you can see examples of my furniture, furnishings, and the install of further reading. Uh, so obviously incorporating fur as part of my wordplay and dark humor of the installation. The wallpaper and curtains were inspired by patterns often found in damask textiles, a woven double-sided fabric created for nobility and royalty. First arriving in Europe in the 14th century, the textiles and papers would usually boast rhythmic floral motifs, fruit and animals, often in a repeating scroll-like pattern. Still associated with the Victorian high tea or the French palaces of Louis XIV, I replaced Eurocentric motifs with silhouettes of animals hunted as part of the North Atlantic fur trade. In doing so, I point to the arrival of both the French and the British to North America, as well as visualize the resource extraction and cultural appropriation that followed. Although not able to be seen from this photo, the wallpaper has scraps of fur placed into the pattern to further communicate how interior and exterior spaces are materially and psychically linked. I conceived this idea from the reality that these animals and their furs were a huge factor in, in contributing to the material wealth of early European traders and settlers, and are therefore material linked to items that would furnish homes of well-to-do families during those times. It also became evident to me how the use of these animals as iconography within the pattern points to the history of cultural appropriation and how the use of iconography that may have cultural and spiritual significance for members of different indigenous communities simply becomes decorative or co-opted in the name of capitalist enterprise for different modes of fashion. Uh, in the forefront there of the furniture, Francis, want me to slow down? Thanks, Francis. <laughs> the furniture uh, up in the front there, again, plays uh, with words, uh, involved me on making crafter furs used in my PhD to cover a selection of wood tables and other four-legged items acquired from different thrift stores. At first, I was trying to simply make the material connection between the wood of the furniture and the natural habitats of the animals we continue to displace and erase as our human populations continue to grow, sprawl, and build. But over time, the four-leggedness or other features of the items, such as their nesting qualities, also began to point to the liveness of the trees and forests themselves. This made me begin to think about how human behavior can even create trauma and suffering within botanical habitats and how we often disregard the communication, nurturing teachings and family that exists within the veg vegetable worlds. In the background, you can see a book on a stand there and then a little book rack on the wall. And this is called Further Reading. Um, in this in little bit of installation, I've covered the binding of books with different types of fur and a small coyote tail sticking out like a bookmarker of sorts to once again point to those animals that fill the lines and pages of history, books, legends, fables, diaries, who are also living, breathing, feeling beings but are unable to tell their side of the story. Beneath the label of this work, I have listed a bunch of readings that can help us empathize with, reconnect to, and learn from animals so we can move beyond a human-centric lens towards our shared environments. Some of the titles I've included were Animal Ghosts, Animal Hauntings, and the Hereafter. Flesh and Finitude, Think Animals in Post-Humanist Philosophy. The Subjugation of Canadian Wildlife, Failures of Principle and Policy. And Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. And last slide, Monica, thank you.
So this final slide shows three in, uh, three installation elements. The large bison on the back wall is a still of a longer animation entitled Homecoming, in which a variety of woodland and other animals indigenous to Canada move up and down across the wall, while at times accompanied by sounds one might hear in their presence. While on screen, the buffalo snorts at the viewer. And when the fox appears, one can hear sharp barks as he moves closer to those entering his space. Projected in amongst a series of tree ephemera mounted on the wall, this part of the installation is entitled Family Trees, a title that points to how furry and four-legged animals have family histories of their own. Every being on that wall was either someone's mother, sister, father, brother, child, cousin, grandparent, aunt or uncle, and yet we don't often consider how human intervention will disrupt or bring trauma to these more than human relations. Michelle Wilson, a scholar working on her PhD at University of Western has been digging deep into historical writings on the erasure of the buffalo on the plains and how the production of calves became fewer and fewer as the herds were deeply affected by their offspring being hunted down. Um, the installation of branches and twigs adorned with the bodies and skins of animals that once occupied forest areas is also placed adjacent to a wooden hot tree from the Alma collection, adorned with an authentic beaver top hat, raccoon collar, fur muff, and mink stole, also from the collection. And using the collection's hat tree, I wanted to draw attention to how humans from the beginning of time learned and borrowed from nature to design furnishing space and functional objects for their own homes. The third element within this photo uh, is the installation entitled face setting on the left. This luxurious installation of lace, silverware, glassware, china and furs viscerally pay tribute to the animals that have kept some fed in fashion and in good social standing while at the dinner table. Inspired by Merritt Oppenheim's fur teacup entitled Breakfast in Fur from 1936. In this instance, the fur is still attached to the little feet, heads, eyes, tails, and mouths of animals. Physical features that confront us each time we reach for a utensil, a swig of wine, or a second serving of food. Not only do these beings ask us to consider how their bodies and our bodies are physically and psychologically linked, but they also ask me as an artist to consider what materials I am consuming and serving up to the world. Will this installation serve to disrupt the meat or fur industry in any shape or form? Or does this work simply subsist alongside or perpetuate the trauma embodied in material histories such as fur? Thank you. Thank you, Jill, that was amazing. Um, on a personal note, I just have to say that that Merritt Oppenheim piece that you were discussing was actually one of the times in art history that it occurred to me that I could move beyond painting. Like, I know that sounds strange, but my mom was a painter. So painting was what I was brought up thinking. And I learned about that piece in art history and it just struck me as being so beautiful and yet disturbing at the same time. So it's always stuck in my mind. So it's fascinating to think that we've both kind of been inspired by her in some way, right? Mm hmm Okay, so we will move on to, so unfortunately we did have a quick 30 second video of the sounds that come out of this video projection, which is incredible. Specifically, there's a moose, right? Is it a moose, Jill, that is grunting? Oh, it's like, <laughs> it's so crazy to hear it in the gallery space. Um, but you know what, now you will just have to come into Oma to see that in live and in person. Um, so we'll move on to Will. We'll give Will a couple minutes to discuss, or sorry, 10 minutes, not a couple, to discuss his, um, his images. And then again, we will open up to any questions that you have here, guys, all right? All right, Will, do you wanna take it away here? And I'll, I'll mute myself and let you have the floor. Sure, thank you, Tanya. Oh, thank you. You can hear me. Thanks, Jill. That was really, that was great. I really want to go up and spend some time in your space and enjoy your exhibition. Um, the thanks to uh, Oma and Tanya and Nanette for, and Monica for putting this all together and, and providing us spaces to show some of the recent work. Um, I've uh, got three pieces that I've selected from the, the the show, which this is kind of an eclectic 
grouping of work. There's about five themes that run through it, or five um, bodies of work that are included in this show, um, which is not a normal way that I would approach the show. I'm usually rather thematic, but um, I'm going to share a couple of them with you. Um, and, the, and this initial one is a is a recent painting that really is uh, is uh, kind of my experience or one of my feelings uh, that uh, we're all kind of enduring right now in these times of COVID. Uh, this is something that's, uh, you know, it, well, never before in our lifetimes, let's put it that way. And so we're all dealing with all sorts of change. Uh, we've gotten very used to virtual Zoom meetings and things like that. And, um, and, and minimal human contact and kind of realizing how much that social interaction matters to us. So I've set this painting um, in, a, in a landscape. There are landscapes in the show and I do love painting landscapes and I take a lot of inspiration from them. But this is called The Last Snow Angel. And it's, it's kind of set, it's set in, a, actually it's up on Lake Tomogamy. Um, and uh, it's at the, the waning days of our winter season. And as we get to enjoy full, four full seasons here, and that's something I love about painting the land because it's always changing. Winter is one of those seasons that we get to do, you know, we've, we've worked out activities um, and there's always been ways as Canadians to work with our land, uh, whatever that might've been through our through the past times. So this is the, a person lying outside of a small um, single fish hut, um, which is actually taken from an image of a fish hut that was actually this color. And it was so inspiring to see nothing but this big landscape telling us that during these times, as in all times, reminding us that nature is in charge, regardless of what we are. We are just one piece of that. So. COVID has shown us that sometimes the small things can really impact the larger picture, in this case, a global pandemic. So nature's the controlling force. We're the inhabitants and we have to deal with this new reality of this invisible parasite that has us at its mercy. Thankfully, we live in a time where we have all these amazing technology things and we've actually have science to the point where uh, over centuries they've managed to be able to work out vaccines and uh, get them into arms and help us get through this. So nature doesn't do these. Parasites don't attack us out of spite. I mean this is not a political reason. It's just a simple single small creature that uses us as hosts for its survival. So we've been forced to live in silos, to live in isolation from our families. Um, to take some of those things that we take for granted in our lives. So, you know, we kind of need each other. We're growing impatient. We have all these different things that we're going through um, emotionally, et cetera. We're maybe fed up with this disconnect. And I thought, well, I'll add a touch of absurdity because here we are at the end of a long winter and as much as we enjoy the winter season, um, by the time winter gets to near the end, we sort of are ready for spring. We're ready for rebirth. We're ready for, you know, green and things starting to grow. And winter can get a little long for some of us. And this is like a long pandemic winter that someday we hope soon we'll be able to start feeling normal again with, I'm sure, a much um, greater appreciation of our own lives and those of the people we love and those around us and just people we, strangers, you know, we meet on the streets, we share restaurant spaces, we shop in stores and things. Um, so, you know, here, here I am looking at this, waiting for this ice to melt, waiting for temperatures to rise, waiting for new life to rise in this garden. Um, and I thought, you know, this is kind of, just a, a, a joyful memory of childhood when you didn't think of much and you could make snow angels. And here's a person that's maybe gone a little stir crazy, crawled outside of their hut, laid on the waning uh, ice of winter 
and decided that making a snow angel was a was a bit of a crazy idea and it's just we're living in this sort of absurd situation so he maybe looks a little sacrificial or or something um, but he's also very alone so it shows us the human condition that we are just we are alone in the great picture of things uh, although we exist with the, the caring of others and the relationships with others so that's just maybe a bit of fun that i wanted to to have something playful to take away from COVID, whether this is gone this year or next year or what, ever, I've got some image that will help remind me of this, this isolated period in our lives. I don't know if I'll actually need it. I think we'll all have a, a long memory of this. But so this is um this um this is what this painting's all about. Uh so Monica, maybe you could kick over to the one that you've had your viewer advisory. Um that's um, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> this is this. This is called the man in the red hat. And I had many titles for this, and I, I, um, well, as many of you may know, or some of you might know, I'm the son of a journalist, and you know our family dinner table uh, back in our days, living as children under my mom and dad's roof, we would talk about whatever the current events were. Uh, my dad was locked across the border in Detroit uh, during the riots, and uh, he would always be in something. We would always talk about things. And, and so the last, uh, you know, four years and longer, um, you know, the, the idea of racism, the persistence of racism in our so-called uh, democratic first world country it's just um it, it i don't know it burns me to the core i mean it's it's always been something that i have uh, rejected strongly so this image actually came uh, appeared in a newspaper and newspapers or media of any kind especially internet has a can have a pretty short news cycle this was shown in a paper and it was an interview taken um, in, I think it was Greensboro, North Carolina. It was, and it was a month after Trump was elected and people felt empowered to, you know, really um, um, feel good about their own beliefs. And that was really some sort of crazy interpretation of, of democracy or First Amendment rights or just your rights to have your own beliefs. So here was somebody in this um, brilliant green, um, obviously brand new Klan outfit, talking to a reporter, allowed him to take his picture, and the picture was in the newspapers for a day, and, and then the news cycle is gone. And I have a whole series um, in, in one room in, this, in the show which are political in nature. Uh, they point a strong lens on racism and um, my commentary. Uh, and, you know, these have been painted over the last few years. So people often say, well, where are you going to hang that? And I said, I don't know. I'm not painting these to hang. them. It wouldn't hang in my home. Um, and I wouldn't sell it to somebody who wants to, to hang this in their home for other reasons. Um, so but that's, that wasn't my purpose i mean i'm driven to the to that i need to do something as an artist an artist can fight you know protest be political with their their weapons which could be their brushes their or whatever materials they work in you know that's what you should do or you may do not all of us but i feel it's important i felt it was important to make this more lasting than a um you know, a new cycle of a week or a month or whatever. I wanted to give it permanence because I wanted to see that this is, I mean, actually it's probably one of the better fabric pieces I've painted. Um, so I tried to paint it with the same brushes and, you know, techniques as an artist that I would want it compelling to look at, uh, I guess, in a way. But um, this is not, this is this is painted not to honor this uh, 
It's also calling it the man in the red hat. And this painting had other names like uh, number 45, Donald Trump was the first name, but I thought maybe I have to cross the US border someday and who knows, are they gonna put my name on something if this goes on the media? So all those fears that I would have. Um, and that, that, those people haven't gone away. Uh, we can hope that, um, and, and they're here, they exist, you know, racism obviously exists in Canada as well with indigenous people and with, with, with some people who live here in our country, uh, with, with black people, with BIPOC, uh, et cetera. Um, and so uh, the series in this room, I think you should take the time to look at them. If you find them disturbing, then I've made my point in one way. And if you take away that my point is to fight and to show this as um, something that's that's been part of our culture, or my culture, my time, uh, you know, as a, as a person of getting to be a bit of an age, um, you know, through the 60s and, and uh, when I became more aware. My tribe in the 60s was all the misfits, all the rejects, the counterculture, whatever we were, we embraced everybody and we fought, we protested, we did everything. So this is a kind of a series of protest paintings that I've included in here. So um, I don't think we have, we need to give anyone permission to have these kinds of beliefs. And I hope that, uh, uh, you know, that we see, we see some change in, in our world, particularly in the Western world. So hopefully that will, will, uh, that we'll we'll see the end of this and there's no more reason to to wear stupid outfits with stupid beliefs i guess that's real artistic uh, you know language there <laughs> um okay so that's enough of that go and um, take me on to the next one and and this third painting which is Got some inspiration from landscape, but it also um, has some elements of my love of just the process of painting. Um, this is uh, called uh, Cherry Blossom Life on Wonderland Avenue. And so this painting actually started as a single panel that I was going to do a studio piece from a landscape that I did, only I wanted to sort of flatten the planes and play with the color and blur the surface and get rid of the normal figure ground relationships and, and just um, and, and um, make it a bit out of focus and, and just play with color. And so I painted the, what would you, you may not be able to see the lines, but the second panel from the right was the first panel. And so when I painted that, I thought, I don't think this is finished. So this painting wasn't painted as one thing. It was a process. Everything was reacting to the, to the panel that was done prior to it. So it was an additive process and it was a reactive process. And it was me getting to use my big brushes, uh, which was kind of fun. And so the second panel, uh, which is to the left of that, so the third panel from the right, um, became the second panel. And this too was painted during COVID. So uh, I only had two four by five foot canvases in my studio and available and they weren't around very much. So finding a third canvas, because by the time I finished the second one, I realized this painting isn't finished. It needs to move, you know, I need another piece to the left. And so the far left side, um, I started to just to pull some of the, some of the elements of design, uh, color, form, shape, line, um, primary colors, you know, black being the absence of color and white being all of the colors. And, you know, just sort of looking at it and putting some of the types of brush strokes that I had used in the center, center two panels. And, and, and then by the time I was partway through that, I realized there's no way this is gonna be a triptych. So, I had to have a fourth canvas, except I couldn't get one for four months. And for those of you who create things um, or write or paint or build whatever, sometimes if you gotta wait, you can, you'll get past the vision for that next piece or something. So I had to wait almost four months, I think it was, to get that 
fourth panel. And actually the third panel was painted over a complete drawing of a, of a painting that I was about ready to paint. So I had to sacrifice that. I hadn't done that piece yet. So I got to the fourth panel finally and uh, finished that off. And by then I was thinking a lot more about the painting. I spent a lot of time on it. And I realized that this painting is really, you know, here I am heading towards 70 well, a while yet, but getting there. So I'm, I've got a shorter horizon in front of me. And so things were taking, were, you know, I start to read things or put things in. You can see some shadowy figures in the ground, in the trees, if you, tree shapes. You can see some forms up there. Um, and on the left, it really, when I finished painting, and it was very loosely painted, and, and I thought, this figure looks pregnant. And the white, um, anyways, I, I, I felt this was about birth. And then the final panel became more about um, departure, or death. So I painted some sort of, you know, whatever happens, some kind of, some kind of um, form floating away into where it is one goes. And I painted, painted the sun-like form, circle out there because that's what makes everything work in this place we're in. Um, you know, we operate on a thin skin of a planet, has all the right elements to keep us going. And, that, and the center two panels are really about where we are now. And that's to, you know, it's full of color, it's full of rhythm, it's full of patterns and, and joy. And, and, you know, that's where we live. And that's, you know, what's important as you get to the little... A little bit more road behind you is, and it's how much you appreciate and how much you should, how fast things go, and how much where you are right now it doesn't matter what age you are, that's where you are in that middle sort of in amongst all that color and form and 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 uh, activity and rhythm and 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 so make the most of it. And the title, Wonderland Avenue, is just me throwing something out that means where we live, the Earth, whatever you know, Canada you know, Aurelia, whatever. Um, it's, it's a wonderland. Um, cherry blossoms, I had been reading about the cherry blossom um, uh, uh, celebration in Japan. And while in Washington, they might just go and smell the cherries, flowers, watch the beauty of these things that come on for a very short time in the spring. And it's a wonderful spectacle for the eyes. And, in Japan, it's more about, um, it's about that, but it's also about the, um, the, the, uh, the fact that life is very fleeting. So the cherry blossoms are, you know, really a, a way to realize and process that your life is a cherry blossom. It's very fleeting and, in in, you know, you get a handful of years and you should you know, enjoy your life, do the most you can with it, and, um, you know, spend your time wisely, whatever that might be. So make it meaningful. So that's um, what I sort of put into it and took away from it by the time I painted this piece. And it's one of those ones that, well, there's a bench there, so you can go and sit and kind of let it wrap itself around you and enjoy it and get what you get out of it, I mean. Just because I made all that up doesn't mean that you have to take the same things from it as a viewer. But anyways, I'll give you some ideas on what I was uh, thinking while I was going through the process. Uh, it's also just about the fact that I love to paint. I love the process of painting. I love the activity, whether I'm sculpting or painting, just the, the manipulation of materials and the colors that we get to play with is just, you know, uh, part of my joy. So... That's it. I don't have a timer. I probably, you can just wave your hand if I've been more than 10 minutes, Tanya. <laughs> you said well. I could keep it up. <laughs> no, it's not that, now. that was so thank you. <laughs> no, thank you for your insight. And I just want to add about this last piece too, that it is five feet by 16 feet long, correct? Yeah, so it looks it looks incredible in the gallery. Like, it definitely come see this one in person when you can because it's quite stunning. And I think, 
I think you would love to just sit on that bench and stare at for a bit and get lost in it for sure. Um, so thank you so much to both of you. That was incredible. Um, I would definitely urge you if you wanted to ask a question or write a question, please do. While I'm waiting for a moment, I will mention the programs that Jill and Will have coming up. And so again, if you want to talk in person, you're welcome to raise your hand and Monica can unmute you. And then if you want to type a message, I will gladly read it to you for the artists. Um, so the programs that Jill and Will have coming up to coincide with these exhibitions. So um, Will is going to be giving a virtual talk on Wednesday, June the 23rd at 7 p.m. So he will walk you through his entire exhibition and um, basically virtually show you everything that's in there. It'll probably last about an hour um, and you can register for that on our website. Jill and John Savage. So John Savage is a local uh, art historian and he has quite a bit of knowledge on the fur trade. So Jill and John Savage are going to be giving um, a history talk on Wednesday, July the 14th at 7 p.m. It's going to be fascinating because they're both coming at it from two different perspectives. Um, uh, John's a very, very historical and factual, whereas Jill is bringing the animal perspective to it. So that's going to be a fascinating one. Jill also has Furry Fridays coming your way. Um, two different workshops, one for children and one for adults. The one for children is called Becoming Animal and it is a four week workshop. And now four weeks in that you get minimal virtual screen time each week. You get a little bit of guidance from Jill and then you move on to doing your project from, uh, again, from an animal, animal point of view, you will develop your own zine, which is going to be very, very fascinating. So that starts on July 9th in the morning. And we also have for the grown-ups, Unmake the Unwearable, where Jill will help you unmake, um, let's say for instance, your grandma's old fur coat, and that will be a two week session. Again, um, it'll be kind of guided by Jill. There'll be half day sessions um, starting on July the 16th. And so those are all available right now to register on our website. The links are there. So um, please do go and check those out if you're interested at all. So I believe I have a question here. Let me just see here. Um, Francis would like to know, Jill, can you speak to your process of building the relationships, how you selected the pieces from the historical collection? Whoa, there's a, there's a good question. Uh, so I, I searched, I did a, the Alma collection has a really wonderful search tool. Um, and I ultimately end up searching the words beaver and bear and fox and fur and was a whole um, archive of photographs came up um, as well as the more object oriented items like the mink stoles and the raccoon um, shawl and beaver mitts and so uh, and then I was able to learn about where these things came from or what they were used what they were used for and the photograph there's many photographs which weren't actually shown in the presentation um, ultimately sort of sh showed uh, personalities from the past who would wear furs and so um, and their history and so I would um, ultimately the archival search system with, within OMA allows you to delve into it quite easily virtually and then um, I was able to go into the archive physically with appointment with Tanya um, as well as uh, uh, Lindsay uh, and, and Annette let me in there once as well and really uh, sort of explore um, how to bring these pieces forward in terms of the narrative that I was looking at. Perfect, Joe. We did, we had a lot of fun down there, didn't we? In the archives. Mm. <laughs> okay, so I do have a question. Oh, I believe I had a hand up. Oh, I think I see that it's gone now. So I do have a question question. Um, Lindsay was wondering, um, Will, how do you keep your vision straight when you're working across multiple panels? And do you frequently work on multiple panels? 
Oh, you have to unmute yourself, I believe, Will. Yes, I just got yeah. the right button. Um, well, how do I keep my vision straight? Well, for, <laughs> for painting that big, I have a fairly long studio, so I can get back, and I'm always stepping back. doesn't matter what size the painting is, but if you're... Um, but I find that's valuable no matter what, if I'm working on a painting, is to stand back. So I happen to be able to get back, uh, you know, quite far in my studio. I think it's like 60 or 70 feet long. I don't get back that far. But. And um, uh, do I frequently work on multiple panels? Um, yeah, yeah, I often do. I'm a bit practical because I have limitations of doorways and stairs to go or if I'm on location and I want to do a big piece I'll you know I have to pack it in a vehicle and get it home so having a wing is not always the best thing so yeah I, I figured out ways to make that work um, does that answer your question <laughs> questions I see that we have a couple hands up so I wonder I see Reva I know that you've asked a question in the chat but you also have your hand up um, would you like to ask it to the artist right now? I have okay. um, allowed her to, yes, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. And hi, Reba. Hey, nice to see you. Thank you everybody for doing this. Well, there's a certain glowing spot in each one, in each of the three paintings in the ice hut it's a thin strip on the horizon. In, in the man in the red hat, it's down the edge of his cone head. <laughs> and in the four panel piece, it's sprinkled across the surface in the little glints. So there's like this roll that the actual landing of light on stuff plays in your work. Could you talk about that a little bit? In that it, I just always love that part of your paintings. Um, well, I guess. Maybe Tanya, do you have, do you, do you, can you bring up the ice hut painting just to quickly look at that little tiny strip on the, it's like in the middle of all of this, that little tiny strip of light on the horizon gives me hope. In this paint, there's, see the glow? Way back, way, 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 way back. It's like my favorite, uh, this is a beautiful painting. That, that, that's my favorite part. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I've, I've always loved the what, what light does um, in, the, you know, in the world around us. Heck, you know, as you know, I live on a hill and I watch the sun come up every single day on the horizon. So I'm kind of fortunate to do that. But wherever I am, I look at the light. I look at the sky. I look at, you know, those sorts of colors that, that come around whatever part of the world I'm in. Um, and I love, I love getting that, uh, that reflection of light in, in work. And um, I like to use colors that are uh, perhaps there, or perhaps a, a complement to the, to the colors so that they show up. So those are kind of uh, um, transparent tones that I'll layer in uh, over top of, the, of this piece. It's, uh, the paint is layered, uh, many, many layers in this. And you know I'll use thick paint and I'll use layers of thin paint and washes. Um, some of that comes from uh, Wayne Thiebaud's work, um, you know, his work out of San Francisco, and, and he, you'll find complementary colors, you know, accenting uh, many of the colors that are inside my painting. So I'll use, you know, purples or oranges against the greens, etc., cetera, or, or something that's a complement, but just subtle, and it really enhances the overall uh, life of a painting, I find, so. Oh, thank you, Will. That's great. Um, so we have, I see two more questions. I, if we could go to Marlene and let her ask a question. And then I have another one down here. We'll do after that, we'll do Francis Thomas after that. And then I'll check back. Okay. So would, Marlene, would you like to ask? Uh, yes, I have a question for Jill. 
I'm really struck by the intensity of this body of work. And I'm wondering if at any point along the way that you felt that the erasure of the white settler person because of the negative activity was, was a need or, or a commitment. I just, the history that you have unfurled <laughs> is striking me as uh, a question we must ask ourselves. Can you just uh, re, uh, can you rephrase that part about the erasure of the white settler part? The question. Well, I, I wondered how you felt yourself as, say, a white settler person mm -hmm. making this work on furls. Did you feel any need to erase us? That 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 was an obligation. <laughs> um, I, I well, I don't think we can um, be erased. Um, um, but I do feel like we need to unmake ourselves from certain ways of looking at and engaging with the world um, so that um, the integralness of multi-species ecologies can flourish and, and ultimately sustain, um, hopefully bring about an equitable a, a sustainable, accessible world for more than <laughs> um, the white settler. Um, and so my PhD thesis, which looks into unmaking as a methodology and the several and the many methods that need to happen in order to arrive at a, a world that is more equitable, sustainable, accessible. Um, some of that is removing ourselves. Um, from spaces, from places, uh, even from even from the production, you know, I'm even looking at um, what does it mean for me to continue to put material objects into the world, even though all of these objects were reclaimed from thrift stores and borrowed from the archive, um, you know, that often that message or that process often gets missed in the final installation. It's there's just just as many objects there as in a well-furnished Victorian home, right? So it doesn't necessarily communicate the um, the amount that we need to reduce and unmake ourselves from sort of this material consumption that capitalism has, uh, you know, um, <laughs> got a hold on us and on the world. And so Absolutely questioning myself and my role and my positionality with it. Um, question my use of humor and dark humor. Um, but what's been interesting is a lot of research on humor as a really important tool for us to move beyond our own suffering and trauma to, in order to, to bring about action um, and reach people as well, right? Rather than um, just blame and finger pointing, like, you know, I'm really owning my part of the story and, 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 and making jokes at it and like, okay, you know what, um, I'm, I'm going to internalize this. I'm going to laugh at the ridiculousness and, and then let's get to get, let's get to action together. So. Thank you. <laughs> that was great because I just wondered how much level of guilt you might have felt in all your unfurling. <laughs> uh, the, the guilt happened last year. <laughs> the guilt was a really hard journey. My, my first year of my PhD uh, really even questioned why I was in a PhD program. Um, and then and then felt, you know what, I have privilege, I have voice, I will speak for those who cannot speak. Thank you. So I see that I have four more questions lined up. So if you wouldn't mind just indulging us, we may go a couple moments after eight, as long as everybody's okay with that. So I will cap it at those four questions, if that's okay with everybody. If you have to leave us, I understand. Um, the first one is from Francis. Um, will, as you spoke, I heard you say the Klan painting was a form of protest, but I'm not clear how memorializing such an image is protest. How are you challenging what this sort of loaded image stands for? Hmm. Take it away, Will. Thanks. <laughs> um, 
Well, first of all, uh, in titling was very important to this. Uh, I don't feel I'm memorializing this so much as, as keeping a focus on this sort of um, this sort of image in our in our world. Um, calling it the man in the red hat was very pointed. Uh, the red hats, the MAGA wearing hat, uh, supporters of Donald Trump during his presidency, and this to me became a symbol of. of hatred and racism and intolerance. Um, so I called it that purposely. I mean, um, there is nothing good about this. I'm not memorializing this. Uh, I don't plan on, I'm not sure what will be done with this painting, but I simply felt that I'm saying to people who wear red hats, who believe in populist and very divisive politics that we've experienced over you know, a growing amount of that, the civility has gone out of politics and we have this very divisive culture. So I pointedly said, you are a racist. You have hatred in your mind. You can tell me whatever you want, why you're wearing Make America Great Again. It's just a bullshit slogan, excuse me, but it, from Donald Trump and anything that came out of his mouth, uh, lies or otherwise, is very hate-filled uh, and you know very different than I was than I believe. So it it really is about making sure you know that the people in a red hat, those people in red hats or brown shirts or anything else, that to say they're there for whatever. Um, populist, you know, democratic beliefs or whatever they see it as, that you're very much, that's you in that other cloak. That is your true colors. You are not just uh, a good guy wearing a red hat because you like whatever you're being fed. So um, not sure if that answers your question, but, uh, you know, memorializing it to tell you the truth, Francis, this painting is probably going to end up in the back of a shelf in my studio forever. And uh, hopefully it will be taken the right way, but it, along with the rest of the pieces that go with it. This is only one that I selected. I think some of the others are much more blatant in their messaging and taken together in that room. Um, you can see clearly that I'm not trying to memorialize or elevate this person wearing a clan you know, Grand Wazoo or Grand Wizard or whatever he is, so. Thanks for explaining that because I was going to ask why the title is The Man in the Red Hat actually. So I assumed it was the Make America Great Again hat, but that's great, yeah. Um, so if it's okay, we'll go to Carol, Heather, and then Matt. Does that sound all right with everybody? So uh, Carol was curious, Jill, that must have been an emotional installation to create. Would you describe your work as activism as well as art? Uh, but I guess this is sort of a, uh, I kind of answered parts, parts of that with Marlene's and that um, the emotional part happened a couple years ago uh, in terms of doing the work as a white settler and what that means in terms of um, truth and reconciliation and land back movement and, um, and uh, navigating what it means to be an ally. Uh, and in terms of activism, um, I don't, I actually do not feel that this work is close enough to activism and that it doesn't actually put me at risk in any way. Um, in order to be a true ally and be a true activist, you are constantly sacrificing your own position and uh, putting your putting your own safety, you know, our land protectors, they're, they're constantly out on the front lines um, doing that work. Uh, and so I'd say it's, to some degree educational, but I don't think it's close enough to activism to align myself with that, unfortunately, and um, would like to definitely move, you know, move towards being more supportive of some of those uh, projects and efforts. I think the one that no, um, 
both of these exhibitions though are bringing attention to, right? Attention to important subjects, right? So I think that's also an, important to note that, you know, the bringing the attention to it is, is an important thing as well. It might not be, you know, as extreme as the word activism, but bringing attention to something is very important as well, definitely. Um, may we permit Heather to speak, please? Um, hi. Hi. Uh, I just, I wanted to speak to Jill, um, having seen so much of Jill's work over the years and her attention to so many issues. Uh, I really appreciate this reuse of so many historical objects. You can hear me, right? Okay. And um, <clears throat> with that in mind, as you spoke, I was really seeing you moving forward into so many of our future issues, which are nurturing of nature and acknowledging different values and consumerism and history and all these things. I'm very curious to know, like as a maker, what happens to now um, all these uh, things that you've collected as voices to the past that aren't actually antiques and probably we don't even know how you house all the stuff that we make as human humans and artists. Um, what, what will bring now new three-dimensional images to your voice to carry on this dialogue? Because um, as we look at all the old objects and the ones that you created, the, the textiles and the wallpaper and so on with reference to the past, do you have thoughts about that? Like, have you already moved on to your new body of work? <laughs> <laughs> I bet you have. <laughs> oh, Jill. Yes. Um, <laughs> thanks, Heather. <laughs> uh, well, um, so my goal, my, I would like to see this show actually travel to different museums. You know, there. The fur trade was important in many cities across Canada. And so the idea that I could travel the, this, the few elements that I actually did construct um, for this exhibition to other spaces would be a way to give longevity um, to this existing body of work. Um, uh, <laughs> And can, I don't know, I feel like there's a few questions in there. So that's one answer. Is there another, something else you'd like me to specifically address? No, I, I think that's absolutely has to happen. There's, you know, um, a whole journey that this work has to take. Uh, yeah. But then I know what I've seen of you that you're on to your next chapter. And um, I love the optimism that came out of what you learned from the past. Mm -hmm. um, as I also enjoyed what Will had to say. I mean, I love the fact that as artists, we see into the future through our reflections, you know? Yeah. And uh, I always like to hear that, that little piece moving <coughs> forward. And I don't know if you are ready to share that or? <laughs> uh, well, uh, actually, um, the PhD work actually has me I'm making a majority of my work um, in order to prepare it for the land. So a majority of my works on paper um, will be uh, constituted into seed paper. Mm. Uh, and uh, then I will be making, a, um, printing an unmaking methodology on that and that will be buried into the ground as well as printing my thesis onto seed paper from old works. <laughs> and uh, that will also be um, planted into the ground. So the, um, the PhD work is how, how can we, um, how can unmaking be generative? How can unmaking uh, make room for the more than human? Uh, how can unmaking be reparative? How can unmaking be generative? Uh, and my primary is on here uh, asking the next question about, well, isn't that wallpaper and the fabrics? <laughs> 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 and uh, I, I love Matt for <laughs> holding me holding me accountable. But the thing about unmaking is that it's always partial. 
and we are makers. And so um, I did use, uh, you know, recycled paper. I did use a, uh, an Ontario printer. I did use re uh, reclaimed textiles. So, um, so unmaking myself from global economies, unmaking myself, trying to unmake myself from new materials. The, you know, we, we can't unmake everything, we can't undo what's already been done, but you can make these little lovely gestures of unmaking um, that hopefully can help uh, give time and space to nature to uh, repair. Love that, Jill. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you've put together. It's wonderful. Thanks, Heather. Nice to hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. And yes, you did just answer Matt's question there. And that was my final question of the night. <laughs> um, so unless we have any other a little shout out. Yeah, uh, I need to thank Matt because Matt provided uh, an audio video recording of Queen Victoria for a part of my installation and uh, in which the Queen Victoria, a bronze bust from the collection is under a fur hat and mumbling. The answer is Britain. And so <laughs> um, you really need to uh, come and yeah, enjoy yeah. the sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's mumbling through fur and so i feel like that's what the animals would hear is just all of us humans going blah 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 <laughs> they pick up on tone and the tone was not good <laughs> so for the artists hopefully you've had a chance to look because there are some comments in the chat here um some quite nice comments that i haven't actually um read all of them out to you yet i've just chosen the <laughs> questions from them um I'm just reading, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, give it a chance. I'll, what I'll do right now is I will give my closing shout out, thank you. And please give it a moment for the artist to read the, the, the chat section there. So first off, thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. I really hope you enjoyed this virtual reception. Again, it's not the real thing, but it is as close as we can get. And it's such a pleasure to get together and to be able to celebrate things right now. I think we all need some more celebrations in life. So I know I've had an excellent evening. Thank you again so much to Jill Price and Will McGarvey for being a part of this. Your exhibitions are both incredible and I cannot wait as you cannot wait to share them with the world as soon as we are able to so I've had a, a pleasure working with both of you too it's been actually quite nice these are as you know I'm new at OMA and these are some of my first exhibitions that I've gotten to curate and to have friends like Will and Jill whom I've both known for quite a few years now be to be able to work with them on a professional level has just been an utter pleasure so um, it's been very nice working with both of you on these installations I think we do have to give a shout out to the Paul Quarrington Legacy Fund in support of Jill Price's exhibition. I also know that Jill would probably like to give a shout out to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for their support of her ongoing work. And for Will McGarvey's exhibition, we'd love to thank the Shadowbox Art and Framing for their support of Will's exhibition as well. Okay, so, if that's it, everybody, shall we call it a night? The praise is still coming in here. People are loving this. So I'm so glad that we had a great evening. And on that note, shall we say goodbye? <laughs>